So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priorities areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service True Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget. Or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. Pag nanguli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. 
Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nanuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. 
Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at pulisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isailalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. to the PIDS webinar series. We trust that there's a challenging aspect of the digital Hi, Ma'am Sheila. Yes. Um, there's something wrong with your audio.
Okay. Um, I would like to call on um our Vice President, Dr. Marife Ballesteros, for her opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Ballesteros. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Gwen. Let me. Is my audio good? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Let me first acknowledge the presence of uh, our key officials from different sectors from the government, Tariff Commissioner Ernesto Albano and Tariff Commissioner Chairperson uh, Marilu Mendoza. From NEDA, we have uh, Assistant Secretary Greg Pineda, um, Director Florante Iktiben, from the Congressional Planning and Budget Research Department, we have Executive Director Novel Bangal from CEPO, for the Senate Economic Planning Office. We have Executive Director Merwin Salazar and Director Circes Nitifan. The House, from the House of Representatives, Director Dina Pasaki. From Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Deputy Director Mary Rose Contreras. From the BLGF, we have three officials with us, Executive Director Nino Ram Raymond Alvina, Deputy Executive Director Flo Sitayan, BLGF uh, uh, Director Maria Pamela Kison. From DOF, we have ASEC uh, Juvi uh, Danofrata, Director Valerie Brion, Director Sheila Castal Castaloni. From the Department of Foreign Affairs, Director Ivan Frank Oli. From the Cybercrime Investigation and Coordinating Center, Executive Director Cesar Mancao. From the Cooperative Development Authority, Executive Director Ray Televaso. From the Farmers Information and Technology Services Center, Associate Director Eva Montero. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of UP Vice President for Academic Affairs and current PIDS, PIDS board member. Dr. Cynthia Bautista, and our former uh, PIDS president, Dr. Joseph Yap. From the private sector, we have CEO Henry Estipona of King Financial Private Wealth Fund Management and Accounting Services, President Dan La Chica of the Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines, Vice President Jeffrey Gadula of Ascent Incorporated, Country Director Melissa Agabin of Chemonix International, Executive Director Ricky Salvador of the Information Technology and Business Process Association of the Philippines, Oli Director Joseph Encarnacion of Olive Leaf, Assistant Director Rowan Barabas of uh, New Coast Hotel. From the ACA team, we are joined by CEO Maria Lourdes Madaso of the AIM. Executive Vice President Mary Amor of the Pamantasang Lunsod ng Manila, and also Dean Luzviminda Gabor from, from the Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Manila. And then we have Dr. De Tereso Tuliao, Director of the De La Salle University Angelo King Institute for Economic and Business Studies. Campus Director Arnelli Lakigan, Lakidan of Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University. UP Virata School of Business Dean Joel Torres, UANP Vice Dean Peter Lee. And from our civil society and development partners, we welcome Executive Vice President Senen Perlada of Phil Export and um, Senior Economist from the World Bank uh, Manila Office, uh, Dr. Rong Tien and uh, Dr. Kevin Chua. From the Philippine Software Industry Association, we have Executive Director Ayn Ng King and Masagana, Masagana Sakahan Incorporated Director Daniel Agusti. So let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the different uh, sectors of society, as well as from media. And, for, and also the, those who are watching this uh, event to the PIDS Facebook page. So today's event will highlight two important issues on digital trade. Excuse me. The first 
is on the taxation of digital econ of dig the digital economy, and the second is on the implications of trade disciplines, such as regulations on contracting, payments, consumer protection, etc. on e on e-commerce. So what what do we understand of, about uh, digital trade? So based on emerging cons consensus among experts. Digital trade includes all cross-border resident or non-resident transactions that are either digitally ordered, online, online platform enabled, and or digitally delivered. Since it is a new and still evolving form of trade, the conceptual and measurement issues are challenging and will continue to be so with innovations in technology and business applications. The taxation of digital economy covers not only digital trade, but a broader aspect of digital transactions. But it is those transactions that are cross-border and cross-sectional in nature that are most challenging. It has been observed that such transactions have presented opportunities for tax avoidance. Moreover, there are also issues pertaining to the allocation of taxing rights and of taxation of uh, transactions involving data. The me measurement, regulatory, and legal challenges of digital trade and similar transactions are substantial and will certainly have implications for the Philippines. Thus, it is important to examine the issues as well as uh, the experience of other countries that are more advanced in terms of infrastructure and institutions. On the study of trade disciplines, it has be also been argued that there are certain trade rules on e-commerce that could result in foregone revenues. These trade rules come from the trade-related negotiations under the WTO. The promotion of e-commerce has been part of the World Trade Organization agenda since 1998, and the joint statements on e-commerce from WTO members have been issued since uh, 2017. In 2020, the WTO joint statement initiative proposed a moratorium on the imposition of custom duties. This is actually a, one of the most common uh, e-commerce provisions that is being discussed in regional trade agreements. In the light of the potentially adverse effects of some trade rules, it is important for the Philippines to assess the scenarios of trade rules in e-commerce and be ready to respond to whatever international consensus that is to happen. The benefits of digital trade is well recognized in the literature. Dig digital trade has enabled domestic industries and enterprises to integrate into global value chains more efficiently and effectively. It is also an equalizer that enables even the MN MSMEs to directly participate in the global market. The Philippine e-commerce roadmap of 2016-2020 has actually adopted digital trade as the future for the for industries. So we see that digital digital trade is here to stay and will increase even more post post COVID. So this afternoon, PIDS senior research fellows, Dr. Monette Serafica, and Dr. Dr. Francis Kimba, and our former PIDS research fellow, uh, Dr. Janet Cuenca will share with us the results of the, their studies on trade rules and digital taxation, respectively. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the, the Department of Trade Industry Bureau of International Trade Relations, who has been working with PIDS, especially on studies about the impact of regional trade agreements. Uh, to give us more insights on the ground, we have invited representatives from YAXA, Asia Pacific, and the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Uh, for those who are not familiar with YAXA, it is an information technology and services corporation 
with presence in Latin America, Asia, and, and Europe. So I would like to thank uh, Mr. Jeremy Raton, Business Development Manager of Theaxa, and, uh, and our own uh, BIR um, Deputy Commissioner, Attorney Marisa Cabreros of the BIR Legal Group. Thank you for taking your time to be with us uh, this afternoon. So again, without further ado, I thank everyone for joining us today. I look forward to having a fruitful discussion with all of you during the open forum. Good day. Over to you, Gwen. Okay, um, it seems uh, our moderator is um, experiencing technical difficulties. Um, so uh, let me introduce our um, speakers for today. Um, okay, so um, for this afternoon, we will be presenting two PIDA studies. Um, the first one is titled Costs and Benefits of New Disciplines on Electronic Commerce. And the second one is Emerging Tax Issues in the Digital Economy. Flashed on, their, on your screens are the authors, um, Dr. Ramonet Di Serafica, Senior Research Fellow of PIDS, um, Dr. Francis Mark Kimba, Senior Research Fellow of PIDS, and Dr. Janet Cuenca, former Research Fellow of PIDS. Um, for our first presenter, we have Dr. Ramonet Serafica. Dr. Ramonet Serafica is a Senior Research Fellow at PIDS. Her research interests include services, trade, policy, and regulation. She has worked in regional organizations and has private sector experience in both academia and industry. She obtained her PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Okay, so let us now hear uh, the presentation of Dr. Serafica. Good afternoon. This presentation is based on a study that was commissioned by the Department of Trade and Industry. Before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Francis Kimba, who is the PIDS Trade Specialist, and Dr. Janet Cuenca, who specializes in public finance. So I will begin by providing a brief background about the study. The promotion of e-commerce has been part of the WTO agenda since 1998 when ministers adopted the Declaration on Global Electronic Commerce. The lack of a multilateral agreement on e-commerce to date prompted a group of WTO members led by Australia, Japan, and Singapore to issue a joint statement on electronic commerce in 2017 to initiate exploratory work towards future WTO negotiations. A second joint statement on electronic commerce was issued in 2019 to confirm members' intention to commence negotiations and achieve a high standard outcome that builds on existing WTO agreements and frameworks. In January 2020, the Philippines officially joined the Joint Statement Initiative on e-commerce. As a member, the Philippines is able to shape the development of a plurilateral agreement on the trade-related aspects of e-commerce and promote the interests of MSMEs. As of October 2020, the JSI had 86 members, which together account for 90% of world trade. The JSI covers various topics such as online consumer protection, paperless trading, source code, market access, and others. Our study focused on customs duties so this presentation is divided into two parts. First, I will provide an overview of the issues and then present some global estimates. In the second part, I will present estimates of the potential revenue losses for the Philippines and then discuss policy constraints and other factors that should be considered for a more balanced appreciation of the costs and benefits of the moratorium on customs duties. Before I provide the overview, 
it is important to emphasize that the moratorium refers to customs duties and not other taxes such as sales or value-added tax. Customs duties or tariffs are levied on imported goods either as a revenue generating measure or a protective scheme to artificially or temporarily inflate prices to support the local industries of a particular country and protect its domestic output from their foreign counterparts. So what is the issue? In the 1998 Declaration on Global Electronic Commerce, there was a decision for members to continue their practice of not imposing customs duties on electronic transmissions. However, the moratorium is not permanent, and so member countries extended this regularly. With the JSI, there is now a move to make the ban permanent. It should be noted that a ban on customs duties on electronic transmissions is now incorporated in various bilateral, regional, and mega-regional trade agreements. In the three examples, the imposition of customs duties is prohibited, but parties to the agreement may still impose internal taxes. Furthermore, in terms of coverage, the agreements have adopted additional terms for greater clarity. Those who support a permanent ban say that this will provide greater certainty to consumers and business. Moreover, the imposition of customs duties on electronic transmissions is associated with technical challenges. Countries that support the ban argue that imposing customs duties on digital products would only hinder trade and discourage economic activity in the internet. In addition, the moratorium will prevent a barrier to entry for small and medium enterprises. Opponents worry that they will suffer greater revenue losses. Moreover, it prevents the imposition of a tariff as a trade policy to support infant and even mature industries. Countries that try to catch up with a rapidly and radically changing economy need time to become competitive before full liberalization becomes optimal. They argue that the permanent ban will leave developing countries with struggling industries as consumers in the digital economy. One of the champions opposing the permanent ban is Dr. Bang of Ongtad. She estimates a potential revenue loss to developing countries of $10 billion if bound rates are used. For least developed countries, it is estimated at $1.5 billion, while the loss to African countries is about $2.6 billion. Using average MFN applied rate, the potential tariff revenue loss of a moratorium is estimated at $5.2 billion for developing countries. High-income countries will experience a tariff revenue loss of $289 million, less than half of the potential tariff revenue loss to sub-Saharan African countries. In the study of Banga, she assumes that Electronic transmissions involve digital products. So her study covered 49 products which are digitizable, meaning they were earlier traded only in physical form, but with digital technology are now being traded both in physical form as well as electronically. The second step is to estimate the physical trade, then using growth analysis, estimate the online imports of these products. According to Lima Kiyama and Narayanan, the economic and domestic tax losses that may arise if duties are implemented and the significant enforcement and compliance costs in implementing electronic tariffs were not included in the study of Banga. The assumption that virtually all physical media or paper-based products would be digitized and therefore exempt from duties under the moratorium was also not realistic. The static nature of the estimates of Banga also fail to realize that the effects on prices and on other markets may erode the benefits from additional revenue. There have been other studies on the potential revenue losses. The results differ depending on the choice of products and tariff rates used. Because of the different methods and assumptions, these range from between $280 million to $8.2 billion underscoring wide disagreement on measurement.
Current estimates suggest that the opportunity cost in terms of foregone revenue due to the moratorium is likely to be low at 0.08% to 0.23% of overall government revenue. Lee Makiyama and Narayanan drew a computable general equilibrium analysis which looks at the impact on the entire economy, find that the benefits from maintaining the duty-free status for electronic transmissions are far greater than the potential revenues that could be generated through tariffs. However, CGE analysis also has its limitations as no methodology is perfect. A key message from the review of various estimates by Andrianelli and Lopez Gonzalez is that ultimately countries should not only consider foregone revenues related to tariffs but also to undertake a broader cost-benefit analysis of the impacts across the economy and alternative revenue sources. The revenue implications of lifting the moratorium are likely to be relatively small and would come at the expense of more significant gains in consumer welfare and export competitiveness, for example, in terms of lower prices and access to digital technologies and services. The International Chamber of Commerce points out that no country has been able to explain how it would be even possible to collect customs duties on data flows without causing significant disruption to the digital world. Likewise, it has been argued that no customs authority has been able to demonstrate how a digital tariff system would work in practice. In the case of video streaming, it would be prohibitively expensive for customs officials to track these millions of electronic transmissions and determine their origin, and it would be nearly impossible to quantify their value. A few important characteristics of cross-border data flows are worth highlighting. First, packets take different routes when flowing between two countries, often crossing different third parties. The ultimate origin and destination of data flows is often a technical issue. For example, firms use mirror sites which replicate web pages in different countries to increase the speed of data transfers. In some instances, what might seem to be a domestic transfer involves a cross-border flow. Data should be valued at use rather than by volume. For instance, an Excel file with 100 personal shopping entries may occupy the same memory space as one with 100 personal health records, but its underlying value is very different depending on the perspective of the final user, whether a retailer or a health service provider. The value of data can also increase when merged to become greater than the sum of its parts. Data also has both inherent and potential value, meaning that information not used today can become valuable tomorrow with changing business dynamics or combined with different data yet to become available. Although data is often described as the new oil, this characterization is misleading. Like oil, it is an essential input into the economy. However, data is not scarce, and the consumption of data by one person or company does not prevent its consumption by others since data can be copied and transferred at almost no cost. In sum, data is different. I will now discuss our analysis for the Philippines by first presenting estimates of foregone revenues. As there is no agreement on what constitutes electronic transmissions, alternative measures were explored. The first estimate is based on the concept of digitizable products. In this scenario, electronic transmissions refer to 49 products in the harmonized system which are digitizable namely photographic and cinematographic films, printed matter, sound and media, software, and video games. Using bound rates, the revenue losses are estimated at $322 million. While using MFN rates, the revenue losses are estimated at $52 million. A second scenario would be to consider cross-border supply of services as electronic transmissions. Kozel Wright and Banga, 
do not agree with this position as they believe that the classification of electronic transmissions should be limited to those intangible goods which are homogeneous, locally storable, and transferable. Nonetheless, they provide estimates to help countries better evaluate the impact of an expanded coverage of electronic transmissions. So this slide shows the estimate for the Philippines using the latest database of the WTO. Specifically, the value of imports by mode 1 or cross-border supply was used to represent the electronic supply of services. As can be seen in this table, however, mode 1 includes transport services which cannot be delivered electronically, so the estimated losses presented in the previous slide are overstated. In addition, distribution services should also not be included. These represent the commissions of intermediaries who do not own the goods they buy and sell and the margins of wholesalers and retailers who buy the goods before reselling them. Thus, the coverage of Mode 1 for purposes of determining electronic transmissions should be further reduced. This table shows the estimates of the potential revenue losses from imports of services via Mode 1 if we exclude transport and distribution services. Using bound rates, the losses are estimated at $1.8 billion, while using MFN duties, the estimated losses are $294 million. Another scenario could be to use UNCTAD's own concept of digitally deliverable services. Here, the potential losses using bound tariffs are estimated at $2.4 billion, while using MFN rates, the foregone revenues are estimated at $379 million. The summary table presents the estimated revenue losses using the different measures or interpretations of electronic transmissions. Of all the definitions of electronic transmissions, the biggest revenue loss would be in the case of Mode 1 services imports. As explained earlier, however, Mode 1 services, while considered cross-border supply, do not entirely represent services that could be electronically transmitted. The potential losses are presented here in proportion to different measures of government revenues. As discussed earlier, Andrenelli and Lopez Gonzalez noted that for developing countries, the potential foregone revenues of the moratorium as a share of total revenue is relatively small amounting to an average of 0.08% to 0.23% reduction in government revenues. The Philippine case appears to be consistent with their observations as can be seen in this table. Based on estimates of digitizable products and the average MFN rate, the foregone revenue is about 0.1% of the national government revenues, which comprise of tax and non-tax revenues as well as grants. Assuming that the definition of electronic transmissions is agreed upon and it is technically feasible to collect tariffs, there are existing laws or international commitments that the Philippines has undertaken that would limit the application of customs duties and therefore even lower the potential revenues that could be collected. The Customs Modernization and Tariff Act increased the de minimis value from 10 pesos to 10,000 pesos. Although it applies to goods, it could later be interpreted to cover digitizable products delivered electronically. Thus, duties and taxes will also not be collected on electronic transmissions with a value of 10,000 pesos or below. The Philippines is a signatory to the Information Technology Agreement which is a plurilateral agreement where each participant is required to eliminate and bind customs duties at zero for all products specified in the agreement. So the ITA-1 in 1996 covered 217 products and the expansion of ITA in 2015 covered an additional 201 products. In view of the country's membership in the ITA, the Philippines can no longer impose duties on electronic transmissions of digital products covered in the agreement. The Philippines is a signatory to the Agreement on the Importation of Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Materials. Under the Florence Agreement, 
contracting states undertake not to apply customs duties or other charges on or in connection with the importation of different items such as books, publications, and documents. Given the country's obligations under the UNESCO Treaty, it could be argued that exemptions should also apply to the digitized products. If electronic transmissions are considered as services, these would be governed by the General Agreement on Trade in Services, or GATS. Under GATS, imposing a customs duty would violate national treatment obligations where commitments have been made since duties are by definition discriminatory. Here we've listed some of the services where the Philippines has made specific commitments either in the WTO or in ASEAN. Apart from the technical and policy constraints that may limit the tariff revenues that could be collected, it is important to consider other factors from the perspective of the overall national interest. For one, the Philippines is a net exporter in digitally deliverable services and in the cross-border supply of services. If other countries were to impose a tariff, then this would increase the price of Philippine exports. The Philippine ITBPM sector would also be adversely affected given the data-intensive nature of the services it offers. In the context of value chains, any policy that would artificially increase the cost of imports would make our exports less competitive. The value of cross-border data flows, however, is not confined to high-tech or data-intensive sectors such as ITBPM. Even traditional industries from agriculture, mining, and manufacturing are relying on data from all over the world to support the various stages of their operations and in the conduct of research and development. Moreover, data and the internet are now critical in driving commercial and international trade opportunities, particularly for SMEs. Consumers are benefiting as well from data sharing across borders. Governments too rely on imported digital products, for example, digital maps, to deliver various public services. As such, trade openness and in particular, trade openness in the digital sector have economy-wide effects enabling productivity growth in both digital and non-digital sectors. Finally, it is important to anchor our international trade agenda on the national priorities and consider whether a tariff on electronic transmissions will help contribute or distract from the pursuit of the national agenda. So to summarize, this paper provided estimates of the potential revenue losses from a moratorium on customs duties based on different hypothetical definitions of electronic transmissions. Practical difficulties and policy constraints which could limit the actual intake from tariffs were also presented. The practical difficulties refer to the technical challenges of implementing and enforcing customs duties, while the policy constraints refer to existing laws and international commitments of the Philippines, which are being pursued in line with other objectives of the government. Finally, we also noted other factors to be considered for a more balanced understanding of the costs and benefits of the moratorium. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, Gwen. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you very much. So I am back. I'm Sheila Sior. I am the moderator. Uh, my apologies for the um, technical issue that I encountered a while ago. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Monette Serapica for her presentation. Thank you very much, Monette. Uh, your last bullet item in your um, summary slide says that a national interest suggests that we should look at other tax measures for the digital economy. And speaking of other tax measures, our next presentation will tackle the issues uh, that need to be considered in designing um, 
a tax system for the digital economy. And our presenter is uh, Dr. Shani Twenka, a former research fellow at PIDS. Her research area is uh, public on public finance pub and public sector economics, and she has done work rela uh, relating to health devolution, fiscal decentralization, government budget analysis, um, health, education, social protection, and uh, the Millennium Development Goals um, and the Sustainable Development Goals. She holds a PhD in public policy from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. National University of Singapore. Currently, uh, Dr. Cuenca teaches at the UP National College of Public Administration and Governance. Let us listen to the presentation of Dr. Cuenca. Good afternoon. My topic is about emerging tax issues in the digital economy. So my research questions. First, what are the implications of digitalization for taxation? Second, what measures the different countries have indicated they would implement? Third, what is the framework for designing the tax regime as identified by different countries? Here's the outline of my presentation. Advances in information and communication technology brought about digital transformations, thus giving rise to digital economy. Digital economy is characterized by unparalleled reliance on intangibles, the massive use of data, and the widespread adoption of multi-sided business models. ICT improved business processes and promoted innovation in all sectors of the economy. New business models have emerged, thus altering the global business landscape. Trade in goods is being replaced by services as digital information transferred over the internet takes the place of paper books, music CDs, and other tangible goods. The internet is displacing newspapers and magazines as the dominant advertising medium. Amid these developments, platform-based businesses which harness digital networks to facilitate transactions between other businesses and users are expanding rapidly in scale, scope, and influence. The pervasive nature of digitalization has brought about difficulty on the part of tax administrators to ring fence the digital economy from the rest of the economy for tax purposes. The rise of digital economy poses a big challenge to governments, that is to devise a taxation regime that generates revenue without reducing the benefits from digitalization. The objective of the study was to review the literature and navigate the tax issues and challenges in the digital economy, taking note of the issues and challenges that are relevant to the Philippines. For my research methodology, I did desk review of various OECD, EU, and UN documents, as well as literature review. Here is an overview of the digital economy. There is no consensus yet on the definition of digital economy. Here are some definitions that I found in the literature. Digital economy refers to the entirety of sectors that operate using internet protocol-enabled communications and networks irrespective of industry. All economic activities using the internet as a platform and digital information and knowledge as key inputs for the process of producing, marketing, and distributing goods and services. IMF narrow definition of digital economy. Online platforms and activities that owe their existence to such platforms. IMF broad definition, all activities that use digitized data, which arguably could refer to the entire economy. World Bank definition, digital economy refers to a new paradigm of accelerated economic development based on real-time data exchange, 
the prominent role of online platforms and data in such an economy is noted. Booked and Hicks define digital economy based on scopes of relevance. First, digital sector. That is the core of the digital economy, referring to the IT or ICT sector, producing foundational digital goods and services. Second, true digital economy that is part of economic output derives solely from digital technologies with a business model based on digital goods or services. It covers the digital sector and emerging digital and platform services. Third, digitalized economy. That is the broad scope of the digital economy referring to the use of ICT in all economic fields. Here is the diagram that shows the three scopes based on Bokht and Hicks. Based on OPAD 2017, digital economy refers to the application of internet-based digital technologies, the production, and trade of goods and services. The study mapped digital economy into two types of MNEs, digital MNEs, purely digital players that operate entirely in a digital environment and mix players, ICT MNEs provides enabling infra that makes the internet accessible to individuals and businesses. Here's the architecture of the digital economy based on OMTAD 2017. The complex and multifaceted nature of digital economy brought about issues and challenges in taxation in digital economy. The lack of a generally agreed definition of the digital economy or digital sector and the lack of industry and product classification for internet platforms and associated services are hurdles to measuring the digital economy. Improved measurement of digital products and transactions could improve measurement of inflation BOP developments affecting external sector stability and financial stocks and flows of relevance for countering money laundering and tax evasion. It should be noted here that reaching a common definition and measurement of the size of the economy is critical in devising a tax regime for the digital economy. The disruptions in traditional sectors that is due to new business models created by digital technologies and tools. The first model that is based on substitution of existing products or services enabled by digitalization or product or service substitution. For example, music cassettes and compact discs being displaced by streamed music online, among others. Second model that is involving digital services that bypass traditional channels and reduce cost for end users or bypass, for example, online purchase of insurance or online purchase of airline tickets or customized tickets. Third, new digitally enabled business model or technological paradigm shift for example, cloud computing, that is a fundamental change in how consumers procure, access, and use IT infra while offering lower cost and rapid scalability. For example, businesses subscribe to cloud services such as Alibaba Cloud, Google Cloud, and so on, instead of procuring and maintaining their own service, thus providing firms flexibility of adjusting their subscription based on needs and also the benefits from some features such as protection against hackers and cyber attacks. Major policy challenges with respect to direct taxation. Nexus, the continual increase in potential of digital technology and reduced need in many cases for extensive physical presence in order to carry on business combined with increasing role of network effects generated by customer interactions 
can raise questions as to whether the current rules to determine nexus with a jurisdiction for tax purposes are appropriate. Second, data. Growth in sophistication of information technology has permitted companies in digital economy to gather and use information across borders to an unprecedented degree. Raises issues of how to attribute value created from generation of data through digital products and services and of how to characterize for tax purposes a person or entity's supply of data in a transaction. Characterization. The development of digital products or means of delivering services creates uncertainties in relation to the proper characterization of payments made in the context of new business models, particularly in relation to cloud computing. The policy challenges raise questions relating to whether the current international tax framework is still appropriate or relevant in dealing with changes that digital economy brings and business models it creates. Allocation of taxing rights between source and residence jurisdictions. Paradigm used in determining where economic activities are carried out and value is created for tax purposes. Global non-taxation that may arise from lack of nexus in market country under current rules and also lack of taxation in the jurisdiction of the income recipient and of the ultimate parent company. Issues relating to base erosion and profit shifting, or BEPS. Challenges with respect to corporate income tax. Characterization of payments may trigger taxation in the jurisdiction where the payer is resident or established and hence overlap with the issue of nexus. Collection of data from users located in a jurisdiction may trigger questions regarding whether it should give rise to nexus with that jurisdiction, and if so, whether and how the income generated from the use of this data should be attributed to that nexus also raises questions regarding how income from transactions involving data should be characterized for tax purposes. Challenges with respect to flat systems. These challenges arise when goods, services, and tangibles are purchased from suppliers abroad in the absence of an effective international framework to ensure VAT collection in the jurisdictions of consumption. For economic actors such as SMEs, the absence of an international standard for charging, collecting, and remitting tax to a potentially large number of tax authorities creates difficulties and high compliance costs. From government viewpoint, there is a risk of loss of revenue and trade distortion, as well as the challenge of managing tax liabilities generated by a high volume of low-value transactions, which can create a significant administrative burden but marginal revenues. Simply put by Evans et al., these emerging tax issues can be summarized into three. First, how to tax a multinational business and other businesses on sales into a territory where it has little or no physical presence. Second, how to assign a value to user-generated data and content and then tax that value. Third, how to compensate for the possible reduction in labor tax revenues due to the automation of routine tasks. The huge challenge is the taxation of the intangibles that is digital and cross-border flow of goods and services. It should be noted that the current international tax framework was originally designed for brick and mortar economy. Brick and mortar businesses refer to companies with physical presence or permanent establishment that is used to assign tax jurisdiction. New business models do not require physical presence, thus they easily cut across borders. The rise in digital economy unveiled opportunities for tax avoidance. 
the heavy reliance on digital technology, borderless economy, and outdated tax rules enables business models to escape taxation in jurisdictions where they do business and shift profits to low-tax countries, otherwise known as tax haven. The taxation of digital transactions in cross-border contexts presents challenges to concepts of right to tax and allocation of profits between countries. The weaknesses in current rules create opportunities for base erosion and profit shifting. BEPS refers to tax planning strategies used by MNEs that exploit gaps and mismatches in tax rules to avoid paying tax. International organizations such as OECD, EU, and UN have endeavored to define challenges and come up with an international consensus on the best strategy. Addressing BEPS is a key priority. In 2013, OECD and G20 countries adopted a 15-point action plan to address BEPS. The action plan was envisioned to ensure that profits are taxed where economic activities generating the profits are performed and where value is created. In 2015, OECD released the final report that contains the BEPS issues and broader tax challenges, BEPS raises, as well as some recommendations. In 2018, the OECD released an interim report that provides an in-depth analysis of the main features of highly digitalized business models and value creation, as well as potential implications for existing international tax framework. In 2020, OECD G20 Inclusive Framework on BEPS issued a statement on the two-pillar approach to address the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy. On Pillar 1, the inclusive framework endorses the unified approach that aims to address the issue on nexus and profit allocation. On Pillar 2, it's still work in progress. It's meant to ensure minimum level of taxation. To date, there is no consensus yet on the best strategy to address tax issues and challenges. Members of Inclusive Framework on BEPS affirm their commitment to reach an agreement on a consensus-based solution by the end of 2020. However, due to the pandemic, it was postponed. IF agreed upon an outline of the architecture of a unified approach on Pillar 1 as basis for negotiations and welcome progress made on Pillar 2. Nevertheless, efforts by international bodies do not preclude individual countries from unilaterally proposing their own solutions. In the case of the Philippines, the BIR issued Revenue Memo Circular 55-2013. It says, existing tax laws and revenue issuances on the tax treatment of purchases and sale of goods or services shall be equally applied with no distinction on whether or not the marketing channel is the internet or digital media or the typical and customary physical medium. That is, taxation rules and guidelines on non-online transactions are applicable to online transactions. In addition, the BIR issued Revenue Memo Circular 60-2020. That is a notice for all persons engaged in business and earning income, particularly those who are into digital transactions to register their businesses. It covers all partner sellers, merchants, as well as other stakeholders. There are also proposed bills. One is by Congressman Wesca Chalian. The proposed bill is HB 6122. 
it is an app protecting consumers and merchants engaged in internet transactions, creating for this purpose the e-commerce bureau and appropriating funds therefore. It proposes the creation of the e-commerce bureau, the registration of online businesses, enterprises, and exemption from business tax in the first two years of operation. Another proposed bill is by Congressman Joey Salceda, that is House Bill 6765. The proposal will effect changes to the way the digital economy is currently taxed to better capture value created into the tax system. To conclude my presentation, I would like to highlight four points. First, the issues and challenges in taxation in digital economy stem from its complex and multifaceted nature. Second, reaching a common understanding and measurement of size and impact of digital economy is critical in devising a tax regime for digital economy. Third, Philippines identified scoping and measurement of digital economy as one of the barriers and challenges to implementing structural reforms relating to digital economy. The lack of official industry data that will measure contribution of digital trade to economies overall economic growth. There is no single standard definition of digital trade and technical innovations and new business models do not exactly fit with traditional sectoral classifications. PSA has started efforts in August 2018 to measure contribution of digital economy to GDP. However, according to this study by Liarina, Polistico, and Pascasio, the satellite accounts are not yet formulated and still there is lack of statistics that explicitly measure digital economy. The study pointed out the lack of international definition and statistical framework, as well as international guidelines with respect to measurement of digital economy. On digital infra gap, problems concerning internet availability, for example, 74% of secondary schools lack internet access. Affordability, the prices of ICT services are among the highest in ASEAN reliability or quality of digital infra that is slow INET speed or slow internet speed that is lowest among economies in Asia Pacific. Based on UNCTAD 2019, digital infrastructure still lacks a universally accepted definition. The levels of digital infrastructure can be categorized into four. First, ICT networks. Second, data infra. Third, digital platforms. Fourth, digital devices and applications. It should be noted that electricity infra is critical in enabling the use of digital infra. So opportunities and challenges that digital economy brings are particularly important for developing countries, including the Philippines. It is deemed critical for the Philippine government to eliminate the barriers and challenges and address the identified policy gaps to fully reap the benefits from the digital economy. The need for development strategies for the digital economy cannot be overemphasized. The focus of development strategies should be developing domestic digital capacities that is closing the gap in digital infra which necessitates estimation of investment requirements. And with that, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Janet Cuenca. Um, Gwen, I, I trust that my um, audio is okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Janet Cuenca and the uh, um, Dr. Monet Serafica have laid out uh, many uh, interesting, many provoking issues. And I can see in our uh, chat box that we have a number of already of uh, very interesting questions. We will have time to uh, um, 
address this, those questions uh, during our open forum. But at this point, let's hear what our discussants have to say about uh, the findings and recommendations they given by the two studies. So friends, we will hear first from Mr. Jeremil Raton, who is the Business Development Manager for the Asia Pacific region of TIAXA. TIAXA is an international uh, technology and data science company based in Chile and with an office in the Philippines. Um, Mr. Raton is active in promoting digital transformation, process re-engineering works, and data analytics to different industries and sectors, including government agencies. He is a social um, entrepreneur, a digital advocate, and a business development professional with 20 years of experience dealing with government agencies, non-government organizations, and the private sector. Mr. Raton holds a double degree in management of a financial institutions and development studies and, a, and has a master's degree in entrepreneurship for social development from the Asian Institute of Management. Mr. Raton, the floor is now yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sheila, for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, Doc Monet and Doc Janet for sharing your insights and the product of your research. And uh, this help us understand why the government or how the government uh, uh, challenges uh, in the new digital economy. Um, in, in our case, uh, like in, in what Doc Janet mentioned about the uh, moratorium on customs duties on electronic transmission, um, for us, it's the, really the uh, uh, issue. Uh, I like the the way how uh, Doc Janet presented the proponents versus the opponents of this moratorium. You know, it's like um, tax taxing the existing pie or enlarging the pie. No, because uh, when we had these discussions on this study, uh, the first issue, the first concern was really. Uh, what's the definition of electronic transmission? What is this ET? ET no? How do you define it? Uh, what are the components of this ET? And why are we looking at uh, taxing or uh, 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 putting duties on this one? Uh, of course, we know for a fact that uh, governments are wanting to uh, gain revenues from this new uh, new space. No? But uh, as what Dr. Uh, Janet mentioned, there's more interesting uh, uh, more interesting way how to look beyond the tariff no uh, pinakita nga ni doc janet yung potential loss of revenue right uh, it's also interesting for us to see the potential gain no on alternative revenue sources if it's not tariff based and if it's an alternative revenue base so what are these alternative revenue base no it is true. Uh, the the main challenge really is how do you enforce, no? The if you want to uh, uh, effect these duties, how do you enforce? How do we comply? Uh, technically, it is feasible, no? Uh, there are ways how we can uh, check from the source up to the receiver, all the pockets. You can do monitoring. You we can do we can do all of these things, but it's so huge. The question really is, is this practical? Diba? I mean, okay, we can do it, but is it practical? And uh, if we agree to use it, there are so many exemptions din pala. I mean, I mean, we have this uh, up to 10,000 duties, no? We, we are signatory to different agreements. So, so why bother? For me, uh, data or uh, the electronic transmission by itself is the lifeblood of the digital economy. And for me, I think uh, it will have a very big impact no, if we decide to uh, propose to put duties on this one. Take, for example, like in our company, we're using different telco. No? We're, we're accessing telco data from different sources from abroad. And we're using cloud services. And these cloud services are all around the country or in different parts of the country. You have uh, some cloud services based here in Asia Pacific, in America, in Europe. 
And whenever do we access it? Anong ibig sabihin na? Whenever we access this, there's a duty on that one. And there's a big effect. Uh, just recently, I think, DTI has uh, uh, launched its AI no, roadmap. And AI needs all of this big data. And in agriculture, uh, where Secretary Dar is proposing or promoting the digital agriculture using IoT sensors, no? uh, Internet of uh, Things, or yung weather map, weather conditions. We're getting it not only from Pagasa, but we're also getting it from other sources. So this will have a very big impact on our uh, delivery of services. So in our case, uh, we see that there must be, uh, we, we feel that uh, it will stifle the growth of the digital economy. In terms of the emerging tax issues, I'm uh, in the digital economy. I think tama yung sinasabi ni Doc Janet. There's so many issues pala, no? So many issues on the taxation between uh, local and abroad. Uh, and that is correct. Just like, for example, we're do, we have this, if you want to buy or if you are a subscriber of Netflix, right? Or a subscriber of other, no? Uh, of other platform base. Uh, right now, Tama yun eh, yung trade in goods. Right now, these are converted into services. We now have software as a service, information as a service, platform as a sub service. It's all subscription based. So, what I think is that uh, ba based on the two reports or based on the two insights, there, there is no consensus on definition of either the digital economy or the electronic transfer. Transmission. So if we don't have any consensus, then we cannot have this defined measurement, defined KPIs. So it will be so it will be like a, a challenge, ongoing challenges. No, um, there's a one question to me, and uh, say, is there a possible way to regulate trans, uh, digit, regulate digital transactions without necessarily ha hampering the growth? For me, we have so many regulations. We have the data privacy, we have this security, and uh, I mean, we have complete regulations. But what I think is what we can do is to create this regulatory sandbox, allow us, allow the stakeholders to fail and also to succeed. You know? If we have this regulatory sandbox, all of these challenges, we can test, we can create solutions and then test all these solutions are this correct or not? Can be can this be monitored or not? So we can see, no, we can do the actual practical cost and benefit analysis. So my take here for this insights is one are this, no. Uh, the digital economy is a space where where us Filipinos can really generate big opportunities, no. And this is also good for the government because it will attract new or it will create new with new opportunities it will create new revenues for the government no? and i'm okay with that as a as a business guy as a businessman as a company we advocate paying taxes to the government uh, but we what we are espousing to the development and maturity of the digital economy it is to everyone's advantage to, to have free access to data as data can grow, it can replicate, it can be transferred, it can be multiplied, and new products and services will emerge. It will create the culture of innovations for us. Secondly, uh, you know, create a conducive regulatory environment. Repeal the old laws, no? Create a new agile-based policy framework. Gone are the days that we are just reactive. I suggest to all government uh, participants here to have, you know, uh, uh, agile-based policy planning framework. No, especially now, be, be, because of this pandemic, it created a new environment for everyone. Uh, let's create not only penalties but also incentives to promote the trust and confidence in moving people, MSMEs, to the digital space or to the digital economy we need a new paradigm shift and a new mindset no and lastly uh my my takeaway here is that 
we could all of these challenges are are true. Uh, there's really big gaps in implementation, in policy formulation, but I think one of the one of the keys is harmonization and simplification through process reengineering of our government services. How we how government works. Let's digitize first, and then once we are digit digitized, then we go to digitalization and take full at uh, take full advantage of this digital economy. I think it's about time that the government will have its citizens convenience as the top of the top of its mind. No? So uh, that that might take on uh, this new two uh, two presentations by Dr. Uh, Monet and Dr. Janet. And uh, for me, and, and as a digital advocate, we are, we're really hoping be, because we see that this new digital economy is a space where where us there's a new opportunity for us to grow and create new businesses for everyone. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman Ch Ch Raton. A very um, important. Um, um, insights that you have, have shared with us uh, from uh, digital advocates and a uh, the private sector's point of view, sir. I I am particularly drawn to uh, one of the um, um, points that you raised that we need to create not only benefits but also incentives. Yes. Yes. yes precisely. And I think we can ex you can expound more on that, and we can also ask the. Uh, um, suggestions or comments of other of our other uh, uh, speakers about sure. how to create incentives later on during the open forum sir maraming okay. salamat so we'll get back to you uh, in our q a okay so, thank you thank you very much so indeed uh, friends the taxation of the digital economy is obviously a challenging issue and we are fortunate to have with us today deputy commissioner Marisa Cabreros of the Bureau of Internal Revenue's Legal Group to share with us how we can possibly overcome the challenges and, and bottlenecks in, um, in, in terms of uh, the taxation of the digital economy. So Deputy Commissioner or DEPCOM Cabreros has been in the government service for more than 30 years and has served the BIR in various work assignments, both in the operations and legal group covering regional and national offices. She finished her master's in Public manage, uh, Master's in Public Management under the joint program of the National University of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and um, Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She finished her international taxation studies at the Harvard Law School and her Juris Doctor degree from the Ateneo de Manila University. She also holds a bachelor's degree in accounting from the University of Santo Tomas. Deputy Commissioner Cabreras, ma'am, the floor is now yours. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this event. It is indeed an honor to be one of the discussant for this afternoon's paper. Actually, um, my key takeaways for the discussion this afternoon is almost aligned with that of Dr. Raton. First, uh, we must take into consideration the taxation of digital economy is a very important matter that needs to be addressed, not with haste, but following a well thought of strategy and policy package. It is a desire and objective of the government to capture tax revenues from this digital or digitalized transaction, but the government also wants the digital economy to thrive. And the government too would like to take advantage with the benefits of having digitalized transactions. Aligned with the saying that we should proceed with caution, else we kill the goose that lays the golden egg. The growth and expansion of digital economy has been accelerated by leaps and bounds because of the current global health issue. The digital or virtual solution of doing business has offered a safer alternative against the scare of the COVID pandemic for all sectors from the traditional brick and mortar way of doing business. But do I do agree with Dr. Um, Janet's paper that the issues and challenges in taxation in digital economy stem from complex and multifaceted nature of digital economy. 
there is a recognized challenge to properly define and create an appropriate landscape for digital economy for the Philippines. The government and the regulators must have a good grasp of the entire ecosystem, making up not just the digital economy, but also a broader scope of digitized economy. Appropriate regulatory and legal framework should be in place, not just copied from other countries, but that is studied that which is applicable and feasible for the Philippine setting. Establish a program to promote and encourage development of the digital infrastructure in the Philippines, not just for the benefit of the public and the businesses, but for the government as well, as a tool for effective implementation and enforcement of tax and customs legislations. This includes proper competition policy to promote growth, expansion and sustainability of the digital infrastructure in a solid foundation for consumer education on digital economy. Roles and responsibility of concerned government agencies should be properly defined, if not revisited, because this is not a challenge for BIR or BOC alone. The DTI, NTC, and especially the DICT will have or should have a significant role with the birth and growth of digital economy and the transition towards, towards digitalized economy. Moreover, Congress and Senate will play a significant role to provide the government offices and regulators with an enabling law to ease the presence of constraints or absence of controls or create and define parameters for having order in dealing with digital or digitalized economy. Collectively, the presence of a balanced landscape for digital economy will, will, will become useful for all stakeholders. It will provide data and information for the government for a more robust policy formulation. At the same time, the government can also reap the much needed taxes from profit earnings of all those who have benefited with their digital or digitalized transaction. It will also provide alternative models for businesses to take advantage by exploring and investing more in digital technology solutions, and government can also take advantage with the digital technology to simplify government transaction for ease in doing business with the public and for the government as a whole for its delivery of public services. In the area of taxation, the BIR has always been consistent with our stand that the tax consequence of the migration of businesses into digital format should be tax neutral, meaning whatever is taxation exposed in the traditional brick and mortar mode should be the same under digital virtual mode. But in reality, this may be a challenge to implement. It's easier said than done. We do recognize the fact that a digital economy and the digitalization of the economy gave birth to new types of business entities, new business models, which challenges the application of the current provisions of the tax code, which has been anchored and designed under a brick and mortar or traditional way of doing business transaction and reporting. The reality is not all existing rules under the brick and mortar mode is applicable in the current digital economy with the digitalization of certain facets and phases of business transactions. Current tax legislations are anchored on physical dimensions of transaction and must be updated to admit virtual realities. At least now, under the train law in 2018, it has introduced electronic invoicing, electronic sales reporting system, and made acts related to non-compliance of e-sales reporting and use of sales suppression devices a tax crime. The timing of the papers of Dr. Cuenca, Dr. Serafica, and Dr. Um, Kimba are very appropriate with the growth of digital economy and with the digitalization of a lot of government and business transaction, the papers will serve as a good reference for the current work in the House and Senate's Committee of Ways and Means in looking into having internet taxation. Specifically, sections two and three of the paper of Dr. Cuenca is a huge mine and references of information to properly identify key players, stakeholders, 
in the IT or ICT sector, the digital economy, and the digitalized economy and define their economic activities. The challenges has been um, clearly laid down per tax type at that, which will serve as a starting working paper so that the government can pinpoint which are to be addressed to be prioritized in crafting new legislations. With that, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Director, uh, Deputy Commissioner Marisa Cabreros. I think um, uh, what we can glean from your from your presentation, from your remarks, is that the position of the BIR is clear, ma'am. No, so you said uh, um, the um, BIR is is tax neutral. So whether it is a brick and mortar type of business or whether it is a um, uh you know it belongs to uh this uh new uh, business model or this uh what we call as digital economy it should be the government is tax neutral uh, perhaps the question now that we need to ask is how are we going to implement it and it, this is a very tricky a very contentious issue at this point so friends uh we will give our um speakers our discussants and presenters um um you know some time to breathe before they're at, uh, before we ask them questions. So at this point, um, I think um, we can have a, a, a short um, a break and let's have a poll because we would like to know to get your polls as well. Okay, so we have a, a question which is flashed on the screen and it is, are you in favor of taxing digital goods and services? So yes or no? So I uh, would like to hear from you. And uh, so we will keep our poll open for um, the next uh, um, 10 minutes. So you'll have the chance to think and enter your answer. It looks like a simple question, but in reality it is not. And I will inform you when we are about to uh, close the poll and I will announce the results during the course of our Q&A. So those who will participate in our poll will have the chance to receive a PIDS uh, uh, notebook and what what uh, we're going to do is we'll draw three names from all those participating in the poll, and and uh, those names I will announce before we close the webinar. So, friends, at this point, I invite our uh, speakers to uh, enable their videos, uh, so our audience can see you for um for the open forum. So let us now start with some of the questions here. Okay. Uh, very interesting uh, question. Um, okay, let's start um, by um, having the question of Gerald John Guillermo. He is from the Ateneo Policy Center of the Ateneo School of Government. And he would like to ask if the legislative agenda pursued by the Philippine Congress, particularly the Internet Transactions Act, uh, can address the issues laid down by the studies. If ever, what particular recommendations can the presenters have in relation to digital economy legislations. I think um, Dr. Chanet mentioned some of those uh, uh, legislations. Dr. Chanet, uh, would you like to um, start? Do you think those legislations, those pieces of legislations uh, could, uh, could address the issues uh, laid down? Um, in, in your study or by your study, Jania? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the question, Mr. Gerald. Can you hear me? Yes, no. we can hear now. <clears throat> okay, thanks for the question, Gerald. Um, actually, uh, looking at the two proposed bills by Congressman Gachelian and Congressman Salceda, I think most of the issues that I laid down in my studies are not yet um, addressed by by these proposed bills because my my issues actually focused on the definition of the digital economy and and the, and because of the complex and multifaceted nature of the digital economy uh, the difficulty in in really uh, drawing up the measure for for the contribution of digital economy to uh, economic growth so i think um yeah they, they do not address the issues, at least at least the issues I laid in my studies. Thank you very much, Janet. Uh, Dep Depcom, um, 
Mm -hmm. Ma'am? Yeah, um, in order, uh, just a additional comment. I did ask earlier permission from PIDS if I can share the papers, the two papers to concerned agencies. In fact, um, I, I was glad to hear that you acknowledged in presence in the audience of representatives from the House and the Senate and the Department of Finance, because um, though there are bills, initial bills crafted already from as proposal of Congressman Gachalian and Congressman Salceda, there is an ongoing study both in both um, CWMs, Senate and Congress, with reference on how to handle digital um, economy and also at the DOF level, because we at the BIR, we are the implementers, so we just follow later what will be crafted as a law, but we are glad that our we are being invited to express our views because sometimes or most often it's not just enough to draw up a law if there would be technical barriers or difficulties in actually implementing it then it will become a use, useless piece of law so uh, i will be sharing your papers with the concerned offices that are working on and study studying um how to address and and capture taxation from the digital economy, especially so at this point in time that we need collection. But at the same time, we don't want it restrictive in the sense that uh, we want it to grow as well. Monet, uh, Dr. Serafika, I know you have been following uh, developments in Congress in both houses. No? So what do you think of this uh, uh, pieces of legislation so far? And uh, what gaps do you see? That should be should be included so as we can fully address those issues in the, in terms of taxation. Uh, hello, everyone. So I think as Janet mentioned, most of the bills cover uh, domestic issues, so nothing about cross border cross -border. transactions. But I would like, I mean, to link it to uh, uh, one question here from. Um, uh, something about Netflix and whether or not yes. uh, about uh, C I think they call it CITUS. And you know, in, in services trade, uh, you have four boats of supply. And uh, traditionally, we want uh, companies to set up shop here and create mm -hmm. jobs. But with technology, they can now deliver services uh, across borders electronically. And I think there was a question here. And also part of the discussion in the lower house is they want these companies to set up a commercial presence or an office in the Philippines. So that's one way to capture uh, their operations and their business here. However, my question, and I'm not a lawyer, and this was discussed a few uh, weeks ago by one of our uh, consultants, whether or not uh, our current foreign investment laws will actually allow these kinds of services to be established in the Philippines because, mm -hmm. for example, wouldn't Netflix be considered uh, mass media? Media, yes. right? And therefore, zero ownership. So, mm -hmm. in a way, we have to look at all our regulations and see whether or not th these are conflicting or, and, or these are still relevant. And, mm -hmm. and I think this uh, particular issue really shows that um, Technology has already overtaken a lot of the um, uh, legal or assumptions and concerns that we had almost a century ago. So I, that's my response. Yeah, you're you're uh, true, true, uh, Monet. And you remember um, Attorney Cerso also mentioned yes. about the problem. Yes, Monet. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Cerso also mentioned about you know the practice of you know in regulatory arbitrage. Yes. So that's one yes. thing, <laughs> you know, different uh -oh. way um, yes. uh, you know, in order to um, do away with restrict restrictive regulations in a particular country. Marami salang ways eh. Uh oh, and, and technology <laughs> allows that. And we're not helping them. <laughs> we're not yeah. helping them by restricting, right? So, you know, that is my contribution. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeremil, Mr. Raton, any thoughts on this? And uh, also, I may um, go back to one of the points that you raised, which is really, uh, you know, very striking. You, you said about, 
you know, creating incentives. And what do you think? How can we create incentives for uh, digital companies? Okay, and and perhaps we can we can also ask uh, uh, our uh, official from the BIR. Yeah. So that sabi mo nga, we should not only create pen create penalties. Right. Or, right. Mm -mm. Right. Sige. Uh, right now, because of uh, I mean, uh, personal experience, you know, dealing with uh, paying tax, uh, we see that uh, most of the regulations or the policies that has been created or being created has these provisions for penalties. If you don't follow this rule or these provisions, then you are penalized for this, for this, for this. But how can we, you know? Uh, uh, in in our minds, how can we invite these people, like the foreign investors, the other stakeholders? Uh, I mean, this digital economy really, um, it destroys all the fences. That's why one of the one of the words that struck me a while ago, okay, uh, coming from uh, okay, Doc uh, Janet, was ring fencing. No, I mean ring fencing the digital economy. While, while everyone is expands in the expansionary or expanding, uh, we're talking about taxation as, uh, as ring fencing. So for me, um, one of the ways that we can create more stakeholders, more participations, more trust and confidence in the digital economy, put incentives no? for mm -hmm. being a gateway. Kunyari, kung if I'm a Netflix or if I'm a uh, like a platform, Form service provider uh, provide more provide incentives for them to take more responsibilities. For instance, sila yung gawin natin, uh, like what's happening now with holding agents. No, if we cannot we cannot charge these providers from abroad, then let's get tax from payment from the consumers. I'm I'm not sure, uh, I'm just saying it out loud, but we can see that these uh, gateways like the ISP. The telcos, the platform providers could be our ally, no, could be go government's ally. And if we want them to come in, let's provide incentives. No. Okay. Thank you, Vijay Mil. Perhaps I can uh, go back to uh, DEPCOM. DEPCOM, because we have this negative perception of taxes ano, when we say taxes. So <laughs> how can we you know, because you have this uh, parang, uh, you're encouraging um, uh, those players in the digital economy to register. So how yeah. can we encourage them to register? Yeah, um, actually, um, last year when we, the BIR issued at the onset of, of the COVID pandemic and the pe people are, are shifting towards digital transaction, online ordering, online businesses, we, the BIR did issue RMC 60-2020. The instruction there was just to register, but we were attacked by all sectors. The natural um, behavior of, of Filipinos or people to res resist taxes. But what we are saying in the RMC was just to register because um, in the tax code, it was required that if you're doing business and if you're exposed or potentially a taxpayer, whether exempt or taxable, you are required to register. So it was just a matter of reminding everyone to register, but having to be exposed to taxation is another thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, <laughs> that's why we were, we were all surprised and naturally people got mad at the BIR, but we were explaining, this is just a registration mechanism. It's like, by analogy, I was, I was telling them, you always like to vote. It, when you reach 18, it's your right to vote. But can you vote if you did not register? No way. You have to register. But mm -hmm. one thing that people are scared of is if I register, then I will be in the taxpayer's net already. So mm -hmm. people will see me. But then mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you did not actually earn income, or if your income is below the range of the first taxable um, bracket, you don't end up paying anything. Now for business taxes, um, there's 12% VAT, there's 3% percentage tax, but 12% to reach the 12% tax bite, meaning you are be uh, above 3 million threshold, the 3 million threshold. If not, you don't, uh, 
you are not covered by the VAT regime, but you will just be under the percentage tax regime. So it's only 3%, not actually the 12%. So mm -hmm. it's, it's again, uh, bottom line here is more um, information dissemination and making the public understand how it actually works so that we overcome the fear of being exposed to the BIR radar. <laughs> <laughs> Also, uh, Depcom, I think we have uh, this uh, convo conversation this morning. I know that it, it also it, it can also um, we can also connect this to you know yung mga issues on where our taxes are going, di ba? So if there is really transparency, if there is really accountability, and we um, we can see the fruits of our labor going, you know, to good causes. So yes, as, as I was saying much earlier. Um, sometimes the way to look at it is on a macro holistic approach. Um, each and every office or government office has our respective role. The role of the BIR is to enforce tax laws. Part of that is to collect. However, it makes it difficult to, uh, for us to collect if the other arms or other um, the, the public doesn't see transparency and doesn't feel um, the benefit of where their taxes go. So it would be easier for us if the holistic approach is also addressed so that people will feel that that their taxes um, redounds, uh, bounces back to them in terms of other government services and benefits. Thank you very much, ma'am. Ma'am, if uh, perhaps you can also answer this. Actually, uh, nasagot na siya ng, ng pahapyaw din ni Ms. Monet uh, based on her um you know your um her knowledge so kasi this concerns yung kay Marion Castaneda um um he said i understand there is a proposal to tax the digital economy in your view what is the best approach with respect to the possible situs disconnect challenge that such proposal may encounter so okay. yes uh um, be for 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 um taxes as we as i said BIR is tasked to implement so we abide what with what is drawn up as a law uh, defining the policy direction of the government. Currently, um, as mentioned by doc, uh, Dr. Raton, there's really a need to revisit the, the antiquated law that we're having because it's so outdated already. In fact, it's anchored on brick and mortar, mortar way of doing business. So, kailangan ng the update. Um, the, the services has always been anchored the taxation of services has always been anchored on where services was performed. But a lot of global jurisdiction has shifted already to consumption, tracking and tapping on consumption. Because if you um, still um, tap it on where services perform, <laughs> services can be performed anywhere and everywhere. And earlier, we, um, there was a mention of uh, Dr. Ramonet to ask entities to establish presence in the in the Philippines in order for them to be to do business here, but to force them to do business here is not really um, it doesn't have teeth because they can always do business anywhere and everywhere and can still capture the Philippine market. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Depcom. Okay, friends, let us um, entertain other questions. Uh, we received several questions from Cheryl Grace Arumin. Let me choose. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. This is um, rather uh, general. What do you think should be a model for an optimal tax structure for the digital economy or a best tax system that will generate maximum revenue? For the government and it will also produce the least burden on the taxpayers. Um, Depcon, I, I think um, it's better if you answer this. Um, to be honest, uh, I don't know the right answer to it because um, if I were to focus only on my role as tax collector, definitely I would say have something that I, ha I can tax. Yes. But it's one thing to say I want to tax. But I need to define, I need to have guidance and proper definition of who to tax, what to tax, what and tax. what's my means of validating voluntary declaration of those taxable base. Because without mm -hmm. that, I would not have a successful revenue take 
because I will just be relying on voluntary declaration of our taxpayers. That's right. That's right. Yun ang <laughs> mahirap. Mahirap yung role niyo, ano ba? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's um, entertain another another question. Uh, okay, uh, this one pertains to our LGUs, no? From um, Sir Antonio Avila. What could be the nature of taxes that LGUs can impose and collect on digital or electronic actions? Any response? Any idea? Um, I'll give um, one there. Yes. Well, actually, taxing authority, we exercise taxing authority at the national level and under delegated authority, the local government does have taxing authority. Um, under the local tax code, they are authorized to collect taxes on businesses, whether in a brick and mortar uh, mode or in, a, or in a virtual digital mode. These are businesses. So these are potentially areas where the LGUs, LGUs can issue ordinances. Again, it will boil down to, yes, there's a drone up ordinance, but how do you monitor? How do you compel them to tax? What are they supposed to report? And who are they that you are requiring to report and pay taxes? That's right. So yung talagang voluntary reporting mom, is very important. Yes, um, the Philippine tax system um, solely or, or wholly report, um, rely on voluntary declarations of our taxpayer. We follow the system of file and pay voluntarily, like filing of income tax return, filing of business tax return. It's based on voluntary declaration of our taxpayers. It is so easy to say na kung ginagawa mo yung transaction mo dati in a brick and mortar way, ano yan in a digital way, di ganun din ang dapat kong itax. That is a practical approach. But in reality, there are gray areas that nanganak and, and, and undefined. So those are areas where we need definition. Kasi for those areas na easily identifiable na na-digitize lang, I can just insist, this is the way you tax it because that has been present and existing before. But what about the new players, the new industries, the new services that got um, that evolved because of the digital, um, the use of ICTs? That's right. You know, yeah. undefined. The yeah, yeah. Need guidance. For, for brick and mortar businesses kasi, ang daling, ang daling i-define ano, ano yung mga taxable. But for, for let's say, you have evolved, you know, you have some of your operations or most of your operations or all of your operations digitized. So, and, you, and if you are the uh, business owner, you don't have a full understanding as well of, uh, the, of uh, what is digitized what or digitalized. So, yes. I think it's very important na maintindihan talaga natin. Yes. Um, um, yes, I guess one thing, the challenge is, is um, have a, a, a proper, appropriate education to have a full grasp of the entire digital economy, not just on the public side, but also in the government sector, so that we would, we would know how the regulators can come in. Because not necessarily a solution is to tax. Let it yeah. thrive. Maybe with the growth indirectly, we can have um, benefits to added employment. But it, it's so difficult because you have to map out what happened because of the digitalization. So, for example, if if I want to buy a book, say, for example, I want to buy one book, physical book, I just go to national bookstore, buy book. So if, if national bookstore is registered, I suppose is it will be, there's an indirect add-on to the price of the book, ng income, and that. Under the digitized yeah. world, I could either digitally order the book, so it there's still a physical dimension of the book that will arrive sa akin. Papasok siya sa customs, so it no longer be monitored by, B, by BIR, pero sa customs na. But there's, a, again, an interplay and revisiting of policies because will it be coming in from customs taxable? Baka hindi, because as mentioned later on, digitized form is my moratorium. Plus, yes, if hindi kasama yung digitized forms of the book, nag-increase naman yung tax-free de minimis ng customs from 10 pesos to 10,000 pesos. So not unless I breach the 10,000 pesos, my book will not be taxed. Third area is, what if there's no physical dimension of the book already? Mm -hmm. I paid for it, ordered it online, 
and the book got downloaded on my PC as ebook. Yes. So know now how to monitor that. <laughs> yeah. Ay, nako. Okay, uh, let us now uh, entertain another question. Uh, we have been talking about monitoring and accounting of electronic transmissions. This one is from Cheryl Grace Aromin again. So, sabi niya, what can be the possible role of a centralized government service business slash enterprise service for information technology such as the Envision Philippine Integrated Financial Management Information System? Um, for the monitoring and accounting of measurable electronic transmissions, can it enable the information technology landscape for electronic transmissions? Um, Monette, are you aware of this uh, planned um, system? Uh, no, I'm not aware. Uh, but uh, just to share with you that when we were conducting the uh, consultations, uh yung sentiment is that uh this could uh, yung electronic system or a government-wide system that can capture all the electronic transmissions might be too ambitious given that even for customs uh and uh, ano ba? <laughs> uh customs authorities even for physical trade hindi hindi pa per na perfect yung computerized systems ay hindi pa na perfect uh, and that's physical trade. Then uh, all the more, uh, it would be difficult and maybe uh, or, or ambitious to even try to capture uh, a system for the gov uh, in, within the government that, that can capture all these ele uh, electronic transmissions. So I think that's one thing that um, we should consider the practicality, feasibility, and whether you know, is it something that is doable. Yes, thank you very much, Munet. Munet, dun sa paper niyo, I think uh, very clear kasi yung pinakita niyo, yung, yung for gun revenues from the um, moratorium on the imposition of um, customs duties, maliit lang, no? Yung for gun revenues. Compared yung potential benefits. Uh, okay, yung, yung uh, first of all, so we're not collecting, right? Uh, yes. And I don't think there's a country that actually collects at, at the moment. Uh, hypothetical yung situation and in fact as I mentioned it in some uh, trade agreement uh, the uh, comprehensive and progressive trans-pacific partnership where we want to I think we've already announced that we want to join that they already prohibit uh, customs uh, duties on electronic transmissions including uh, digital products so um uh, and question the so uh, it, it's difficult to uh, actually measure and it in fact we're not collecting so even the concept of foregone revenues is uh, hypothetical because it's not oh it's not like we're, we're doing it now um and and then i connect i, I think my question do na ano yung ano yung ideal na measurement of electronic transmissions my view is that anything that we can measure is the one that we should use and not measure at the macro level it's something that uh, for example a customs agent yung equivalent lang makikita ba niya talaga mamomonitor niya alam niya kung itong product na to itong itong bits of information na, na nakikita niya sa monitor ito ba ay tax is it part of what uh, we consider as the as a start uh, as a, a product that we can impose tariff uh, tariffs or customs duties on so for me um it's really a question of is it something that we can measure but having said that and uh, although we didn't say this categorically in the report because we don't do that my personal view is that i would not again i'd rather look at other forms of of taxation rather than customs duties okay um, other um, forms of taxation oh. uh, indirect taxes <laughs> uh oh, oh. I, but by the way uh while i have the uh, no, floor uh, we did not, may isang emerging product that we did not consider and that is uh, 3D printing. So, meron ding sinasabi na ito hindi pa, hindi pa lagana pero uh, balang araw baka, ma, you know, the, 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 the price of these products or digital products can be beyond 10,000 uh, pesos. Kasi pwede yung ano ba, uh, model ng kotse or model ng model ng bahay so mahalaga siya but having said that again 
is is tarification uh, the best option or do we uh, rather encourage local businesses or local industries to uh, to be competitive so that we can also export uh, 3D printing models. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Monet. Um, just a gentle reminder to our audience, no? so we still have this ongoing poll and we will um, we will close it in, in five minutes. So in case you haven't answered it, you are welcome, very much welcome to join our poll on the question, are you in favor of tax and digital goods and services? Yes or no, we will close it, automatically close it in, in five minutes and I will announce the, re, the, the result. Okay, let's go back to our uh, chat questions. Um, okay, hold on. Um, okay. So. Okay, so this one is, uh, I think, addressed to you again. Um, uh, but it, this is about Okay, that's your slate. From Greg, um, uh, from uh, Sir Greg Pineda uh, of of uh, the Neda, there is a computation of potential tariff revenue losses from the moratorium and taxation of uh, electronic um, transmissions. Is there an estimate of potential trade in investment losses from its removal? If ever, so what is the critical tipping point for a sound? decision. Monet, um, any response on this? Because um, uh -huh. what do you mean by removal? Like, uh, so as I mentioned, we're not collecting this. Yes. So yeah, I, I, I guess the investment and trade uh, decisions would be uh, dependent on other factors, not mm -hmm. in terms of because so what we're arguing or what I am advocating advocating is that we look at other tax measures because if so for example yun, so iko connect ko dun sa investment if if we want to uh, attract if you want to be part of the global value chains right mm -hmm. so meaning you import what you export therefore uh, you don't want your imports to be uh, necessarily or artificially expensive mm -hmm. because that will make your exports competitive right mm -hmm. so i i guess that is the uh, transmission and that is the relationship between having customs duties and be uh, attracting businesses that would like to stay here uh, or uh, set up shop here uh, as part of the global value chain. It might be a uh, disincentive. And as I mentioned in RTAs, like in, uh, like the mega regional agreement, tinanggal na, tinanggal na nila yan. Uh, mm -hmm. um, as I think in one of the slides, one of the important things for business is certainty predictability so ayo na nila uh, ayo na nila every two years either they consider a review uh, if uh, they would prefer uh, certainty in terms of whether they you know uh, these tax measures will be imposed in the future thank you very much monet we have a question here from anthony patrick chua um the he said the the APEC Business Advisory Council of or ABAC recommends to make permanent the moratorium and customs duties on electronic transmission. We believe policies must be updated for the digital age and responsive to modern business and social concerns. The permanent moratorium will also put in place predictability in the policy environment. You mentioned that Monet, which businesses need, given the fact has also pointed in the research that there's still there is still no definitive agreement or consensus to what constitutes digital goods or services or and services and digital trade. ABAC Philippines as representatives to ABAC shares this position. Any comment from the presenters and reactors and any thoughts how we can approach this kind of discussion at the regional level? Um, perhaps uh, I can we can hear the thoughts of our other speakers on this. Is this the same, Janet? Perhaps you can, you can, although this is not your study, but uh, would you like to uh, to react on uh, this uh, comment by uh, Anthony Patrick Chua? Can you repeat or that? Or perhaps I can go the first comment? to uh, Jeremil, Mr. Raton. Um, 
for me actually I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, 50-50 on that at the moment no I mean uh, uh, for me uh, as I mentioned uh, a while ago or earlier on my end I think that the removing these duties is good no because mm-hmm. it creates a uh, it gives it creates a free flowing uh, data flow in the digital economy however we don't know yet kasi I mean in the future we don't know yet what will happen, what will be the policies, not only for the Philippines, but as they, as he mentioned, on the regional and the, at the global level. So for me, I think uh, let's wait for probably another two years. Uh, there's mm-hmm. still uh, two years or three years for that to be fully developed because digital economy is still, uh, for me, I think it's still in the infancy, infancy stage. And it continues to evolve, no? Yes, correct. Mm-mm. So it's not Monet, it's this is not uh, permanent yet and it's uh, you said it's reviewed every 2 years ba? Uh under the JSI you uh so uh, uh how should I uh, respond to that? So uh it's a practice that uh, uh, uh countries so WTO members uh do not impose customs duties. So practice also because as I mentioned I don't think it's doable at this time. Mm-hmm. Now, now under the JSI uh so they they made this decision in 1998. Now under mm-hmm. the JSI the question is should we, should we make this permanent instead of review, renewing it every 2 years. Mm-hmm. So I think yon so yun yung uh questions na yes, din right. discuss nila. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Anat, yes, I can see you are raising your hand. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, regards the comments from Dr. Anthony Chua uh, regarding the APEC uh, Business Advisory Council. Is that a comment that uh, they're committing on? Yeah. Hello, yes. Sheila? Yes. Yeah, is it the comment, uh, the one on the permanent thing of the. Uh, our representative from APEC. From uh, APEC Business uh, Council. Yeah. It yes. recommends to make permanent the moratorium. Yeah. Janet, we cannot hear you. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm holding okay. my mouth. <laughs> he, he was he was saying that the EBAC is for um uh, Yeah, uh, actually for the permanent moratorium. Actually, as mentioned by Doc Monet, earlier the philippines is a net exporter so we actually will benefit from the permanent moratorium uh, but if the the jsi actually um, decides that this uh, be um, uh, not uh, done permanently i think the next question to ask is how do you actually track the cross-border flow of goods and service services I'm, I'm, I mean, all countries should have the digital infrastructure to really track all the transactions in the digital economy to be able to to impose the duties on on these uh, transactions. I think that's the more difficult question to to answer, rather than whether it's it's okay or it's better or it's best to to have it permanent or non permanent. Thank you. Thank you very much. A while ago, we were talking about incentives, no. Um, and there is, um, okay, there is a question here from Dr. Peter Liu. Uh, he said, he asked, would it be feasible for the government to offer an incentive, for example, credit for internet load to consume to report purchase of a digital good from a Philippine seller? This would incentivize consumers to report their purchase, which the BIR can then bill the domestic seller for the consumer tax. Bepcom, um, any thoughts on this? Well, that is something that, that, that can be considered to encourage reporting of um, potential sellers or transactions that might, might not be registered in the BIR. Something like that, but in a brick and mortar way, we have done as a project in the BIR. Remember the uh, recibo mo, uh, where we encourage taxpayers to report and submit to us recibo and have a raffle draw for it. So parang ganyan din yan to encourage reporting of these transactions. It's something to to consider as a um, policy, but will it trip um, the targeted 
um, reporting or uh, it's it's something to be seen and and uh, to tested. Yeah, 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 but possibly okay. something to, to consider, no, uh, Depcon, no. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or, or yes, Michelle. Yes, I think we, we may want to look at the the practice by Indonesia. They actually oh. assigned um, companies, digital companies, to to be uh, cross border fat collectors. So maybe uh, it's one direction that the Philippine government would like to uh, take as well. So I don't know whether whether the VAT collectors actually get something out of the of that um, uh, commitment for for being VAT collectors for the for the Indonesian government. But I think it's something that we can uh, take a closer look at. Thank you very much, Janet. Ah, uh, Jeremy, Mr. Raton, I see you nodding your head. Uh, yeah, for, to contribute. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's like uh, whether it's based, it's a consumer-based no approach, or from the stakeholders approach, or let's say the gateway. No, uh, I I'd like to suggest that probably uh, BIR could look into uh, put these uh, applications like in a in a sandbox sandbox. Where everybody could test it. You're correct. I mean, before we have this uh, receivo, no? but it's manual mm -hmm. based. But right now, because of new technologies, uh, we can just convert it into a mobile application where a uh, consumer can just take a picture of his receipts and, and then uh, just check it. Uh, what, that is one option. And like Doc, Doc Janet mentioned, the other way could be the uh, the gateway provider the platform provider service providers could be the bat collectors uh on our on your behalf so uh if this could be done in, in a sandbox environment where we could see you know could see and test them then this could be uh one opportunity that bir could uh could uh, uh test and see if it's it will be advantageous you know? thank you very much chair mill Another question here, and this time it's again uh, for you, um, uh, Depcom Cabreros. Uh, the, he, this one is from Marion Castaneda of Isla Lipan and, and Company. He's, he would like to know about the progress from the BR, BIR side in terms of establishing the necessary infrastructure slash system to set up um, electronic sales reporting system. It is interesting. He, he she added. It is interesting to note that the five five years from effectivity of train would be lapsing in twenty twenty three. But at least publicly, uh, he said um, she's not aware of any progress on it. Uh, perhaps you can, you know, uh, clarify. Um, yes. And give us updates on this, ma'am. Yes. Um. Under the train law, which was effective 2020 28 became effective 2018 there was a mandate to transition towards use of e invoicing and e receipts and five years were given five years so the right it's up until 2023 it's an ongoing um project mandatory for certain sectors of the um industry particularly mandatory for the large taxpayer service to be using electronic invoice and and receipts some of them are already registered um, with electronic invoice and, and receipts, but having to mandate everyone is still an ongoing project. We um, mention a sidetrack tie because of the COVID pandemic where we were also um, fast tracked in having to digitize the delivery of public service by the BIR. Kasi para mawala yung or malesen yung face to face. Um, transaction with the taxpayers so it's an ongoing project po. um uh, i'll have to get back um i know the name from easily pana so i have to get back to you with the actual update from our it group thank you very much for that um Dep depcon cabreros um when uh, can you show us can you flash the results of our poll Gwen? Okay, so our poll is on the question, are you, are you in favor of taxing uh, digital uh, uh, goods and services? Uh, yes, was, um, 65 answered yes, and uh, no, 
uh, 12 so more in favor of taxing uh, digital um, transactions. So, and as I've said, we will draw two winners or um, names of um, uh, our winners of those who participated in our poll, we will draw uh, three names. So let me um, announce the winners now. Sheena Guevara, Jefferson Sumalabe, and Marvin Joseph Manuel. So thank you very much for um, joining our uh, poll afternoon. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's entertain some more questions. We have uh, time left pa. So, meron pa tayo mga questions dito. Um, okay, this one is from, ah, okay, let, um, let's entertain a question from Facebook. And this one is from uh, Macray Barderlipe II. Um, I wish to ask if there are still disjoint aspects of taxation that needs to be harmonized with respect to the proposed amendments to the Foreign Investment Act, Internet Transactions Act, the Corporate Re Re Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprise Act, the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and the Public Service Act, among others. Um, okay. Actually, uh, yes. There are a lot of things to be to consider. It takes an in-depth study of not just the tax code, but all the inter interrelated laws in order for us to be successful and depending on the policy direction that the government will later choose. Say, for example, for digital um, economy, if we are to top consumption, so meaning um, consumption base, yung, if we focus for the means of monitoring taxation, so meaning you need to know the flow of payment. Mm -hmm. Having to check on the flow of payment we need to revisit what's the policy on bank secrecy law because the Philippines is one of the few countries who still have bank secrecy law. The BIR cannot even look into bank accounts because we are restricted because of bank secrecy law. So there are a lot of interrelated um, policies that is affected or restricted because of the current drawings of um, laws. So marami po, it has to have an in-depth study to identify what needs to be changed or updated. Thank you very much, um, DEPCOM. Okay, so many questions. Uh, so this just uh, reflects the interest of our audience in this in this topic, no? So, okay, uh, Anthony Patrick Shua has another question. Uh, he said HD 6944 of uh, Representative Sharon Garin actually proposed to impose digital tax of 6%. Oh, actually, uh, uh, he was just sharing this uh, piece of information. 6% of gross sales of digital services to Philippine-based consumers. We need to carefully craft policies as not to further hurt our industries. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Yes. Uh, not just not just um, need to study in depthly, not to hurt the industry, but also to look into the interplay of other existing laws. Because even if there is a legislation to tax six percent digital services, will there be not uh, anything that would serve as a loophole, as a workaround of by the players in order not to pay those taxes? Okay. Okay. Um. Another question from FB, uh, Macray Barderlipe, okay, a regulatory, I, I also remember he said uh, that regulatory impact assessment needs to be carried out before any regulation is issued by the government. I wonder if the anti-red tape authority, the implementing agents for RIA, already released any RIA results on the digital taxation regulation agenda. I'm not sure if uh, this is something that you would like to answer, Depom, or any of um, our speakers. It's okay if we can... Anyone? It's okay. No problem. Uh, we can go to uh, other questions here. Um, okay, also from FB, maybe BIR also can consider to eliminate the actual filing of ITR forms since they are already electronically filed. 
Um, actually, because of the, the pandemic, we are really uh, promoting electronic filing of um, transaction, electronic transactions with the BIR, and I'm happy to report um, for this April 15 income tax return filing, we did record 99.63% electronic filing of returns compared to same period of last year, which was only 90%. Um, percent. So more and more people are taking advantage of the ICT to do transactions with the BIR. Now with the, with the physical filing of the ITR, we have already addressed that one. There is already an application in the system, which we call electronic um, submission. So the the filing actually is not the return itself because it has already been electronically filed. The forthcoming expectation is the filing of the attachments to the return. There's a solution already to that where you can scan the, the copies and electronically submit it to us via the application EAFF, A -A um, AFS, or the electronic um, AFS submission. So, pwedeng hindi na rin po physically pumunta sa BIR. Okay, thank you for setting uh, the record as straight left from Cabreros. Ma'am, uh, perhaps you can also ans answer this because um, we have seen the, you know, so many people getting into vlogging, no? So yes. these are mga small time vloggers, mga big time vloggers, mga no celebrities, and they are earning from from it, no? Through advertisements. So Dennis Ariel Tan um, has this question on um, how how does BIR monitor this and um, are they also uh, subjected to taxes? And and um, have you have may mga di ba sabi niyo yung sa registration may mga nag Dami na bang nag-register ng bloggers um, ang, ang parang nature of uh, activity or nature of enterprise? Yes, um, since last year when we did encourage and reminded one that even if in your you are in the electronic format, you too are required to um, comply with registration requirement. We did have um, significant increase in, in registration of taxpayers. So, um, services like yung vloggers, they are also um, required to register. May mga nag-register na rin po, and they are also paying and reporting um, taxes naman po. But others, again, it's a continuous uh, campaign for the BIR to convince them and ask them um, to be reporting kasi mas mahirap po if um, later on is mahuli sila ng BIR and ma-assess na because that wouldn't mean additional penalties and incremental penalties for non-compliance. Yeah, kasi nga voluntary reporting ano ma'am? Yes po. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we are down to our last two questions. So let me just uh, pick uh, the last two questions from our audience. Um, okay, let me go back to one of the Okay, Cheryl Grace Arumin, in determining tax incidents or the one who bears, who, who will bear the tax burden for digital economy, what factors should we consider? Uh, Janet, would you like to um, share your point, share yeah. your uh, reaction or your response uh, to this question? Yeah, um, actually, since we are not imposing new taxes, as mentioned in the BIR memo circulars, um, BIR will be tax neutral, right? So actually, uh, um, Ms. Cheryl's question is actually, uh, how do you call this? Um, I, I, I need to, to do an, an, an analysis to, I mean, we need data to really uh, get the tax incidence for, for this uh, taxes on uh, digital transactions. So yeah, it's it's hard to to, to answer the, the question yet because we actually don't have data yet on on this uh, digital transactions. If we ask BIR, I think uh, they are also having difficulty uh, getting uh, the the data to be able to study this uh, kind of analysis, tax incidence analysis. Mm -hmm. So right now we don't have data as well on for gun revenues. 
Yeah, um, because of because actually uh, we still uh, I think the PSA has still yet to uh, draw up the classification for for digital transactions, mm -hmm. right, Attorney Cabreros? Yes, and we do have what we call the PSIC or the Philippine Standard um, Industry Code. That too needs to be updated because wala doon yung mga digital transaction or the digitized transactions in, in businesses. Thank you very much, Attorney. Okay, let, let's go to our last uh, question. Uh, okay, from Abel Amal Disangkopan. Uh, he is from the Bangsamora government. Did you consider BARM? For this, uh, Medjo, Sir Abdel, um, I, I, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand the context of your question. Medjo, uh, hindi ata kompleto. So, sorry, sir, but we have to part your question for now. But you can discuss on this. Yes? Hi. Uh, I think, you know, uh, Francis would like to say something. Not about the BARM question, but uh, about okay. the previous, you uh, know. Uh, comment. Sorry, sorry Our about co-author, Dr. Kimba. Hi. Uh, good Go ahead. afternoon, Go everyone. Ahead, Francis. Uh, hi, Sheila, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, congratulations for a very um, lively discussion. So I, I just want to um, discuss or, or say something about the, the question on um, uh, the, the the Philippine position no on on the JSI and, um, and uh, of course I, I I echo the position of the paper that we have to um, look at the Philippines in terms of uh, data importer and also uh, data exporter because we are um, uh, exporter of uh, digital services and we want to be able to um, promote and uh, support uh, that this uh, growing or nascent industry in, in the Philippines. Uh, but I also want to, to mention because um, uh, Sheila, I, I think this is going to also be plugging the, the next round of uh, seminars for PIDS. Now we will be pro talking about um, the digital trade integration in in yes, the, so, in the seminar on that Francis no, so June three. We're, yes, we're in one of the uh, speakers. Thank you. Yes, and that is also very important because what what we want to have is uh, our our regulations and our well not just our regulations but our, also our infrastructure and also our skills should be uh, in a way somewhat aligned to what is uh, going on in the region and. The, the Philippine position is actually also aligned. We also want to align ourselves with, um, you know, with what is going on and we want to be. And uh, although we are already in a position where we can already, um, we're already integrating with the other countries in the region in terms of allowing the flow of data, free flow of data, and uh, a very strong position in terms of um, uh, um, uh the, the the digital the tariffs and uh, allowing uh, additional um uh, flow of um flow of goods we there is actually a, a very large um complaint on consistency and uh, the application of the regulation so that's the one thing so even if we for example even if we are able to impose um taxes and regulations what is important is uh, we we are consistent and uh, we are we're we actually have the capacity to really um impose these uh consistently and without um uh, allowing others to take advantage of loopholes as was mentioned earlier so um that that would be the my my input to to, to that. Thank you very much, Francis. We'll hear more from you on June 3, okay? So, yes, um, yes. Dr. Thank Kimba you. and uh, Dr. Bal Ulip will talk about uh, digital trade and digital health integration, respectively. So, see you on, on June 3. So, just to wrap up our open um, forum, our conversation today, may I ask for um, some final words from our, um, uh, from our speakers, from our presenters, and from our discussants? 
Um, Monette, may I start? May we start from you, then Janet, and then uh, uh, Ms. Chair Mil uh, Raton, and of, of course not, but definitely not the least from from um, Depcom uh, Cabrera. Monette, final words. Um, ano ba? I guess uh, yeah, th this is an exciting space and it's an area where I think the Philippines can actually excel in. So let's not rush into regulations that might uh, uh, unnecessarily hurt us. Uh, and I, yeah, I guess I, that, that would be my message. Uh, so uh, taxation is good, uh, well, you know, for, for obvious reasons, but uh, maybe discriminatory types of taxations uh, and this it doesn't apply to digital world only, even in other issues that we have, uh, we are, we are experiencing now. So discriminatory type is not necess won't uh, necessarily help us in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monet. And Dr. Janet Cuenca. Hi, thank you, Ms. Sheila. I actually would like to highlight the importance of really developing our own development strategy for the digital economy. It's a good thing uh, uh, that the DOF, as mentioned by Attorney Cabreros, is uh, drafting the the development strategy for the develop uh, for the digital economy. Uh, I hope that uh, we can uh, get a copy of such strategy, and uh, hopefully we can provide in inputs as well. Thank you, and thank you very much, Dr. Cuenca. Um, Ms. Chair Mil Raton, thank you, sir, for um, joining us today. And uh, we'd like to hear some final words from you, sir. Yeah. Uh, once again, thank you for uh, Paige for inviting me as one of your uh, discussions uh, for this webinar. Uh, as like what mentioned by Doc Monet, the digital economy is really a big space where we can really excel a lot. And um, although regulations is good for to protect our consumers, merchants. In this digital space, but at the moment, let's promote you know uh, everybody's participations in the digital economy. Let's create this uh, sandbox for uh, the government and the private sectors to come in, join together, and create this uh, uh, wonderful environment for us to exist all together. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raton and uh, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Cabreras, ma'am. Hi. Um. Yes. Good afternoon. Before I I say my final um uh, message, you you did mention um from Mr. Abdel Hamal Disankopan a question about the Bangsamoro government. Um. He was asking earlier whether this the Bangsamoro government has been considered. I okay. guess this can be an input to the Bangsamoro government because they were given autonomy to craft their own um Bangsamoro Barm tax code. So. This too can be something you can consider as input, maybe not immediately on taxation, but on the mode of using um, ICT in delivering services and at the same time establish and create, um, having already a framework for monitoring for efficiency and effectiveness in, in monitoring the Samoro tax later on. So as a closing remark, thank you again for the opportunity to be um, invited in this forum. Um, there's a lot of learnings and it is um, just a reminder. It is not a challenge for the Philippines. A lot of jurisdiction is facing the same challenge. So it's just a matter of having to choose um, which areas to focus on. We might not be able to address it uh, holistically, but maybe bits and pieces of it. We can um, have some rules so that we can maximize um either the revenue or the growth of the digital economy thank you and thank you very much uh attorney cabreros friends uh, please join me in thanking our our presenters uh dr johnny cuenca dr ramonet serafica mr jeremy raton and uh deputy commissioner cabreros for uh the um the knowledge the information and the insights that that they have shared with us this afternoon. Let us give them a big virtual clap. And all our participants who, uh, who uh, join us in the open forum for very insightful, very thought-provoking questions and comments. Okay? So friends, we hope that our conversation today 
has uh, contributed to a deeper understanding of the taxation issues surrounding the dig uh, digital economy. I'm sure you have a lot of take takeaways. Uh, and if there is one key message that um, we can glean from today's uh, discussion as far as taxation is concerned, I think it is the need to uh, um, strike a balance between uh, revenue generation and long-term growth. No? So I think more than asking whether we should impose tax on digital goods and services, what we must, another important question or what we must really ponder on is how should taxation be imposed in uh, such that it will not stifle uh, the growth of the digital economy and instead support and promote its expansion. Okay, so maraming salamat po. And finally, we have some reminders. Um, okay, uh, friends, uh, okay, you can download the uh, copies of our presentations from the PIDS website and flash on the screen are the links okay and uh please help us improve our webinars by answering our survey um our your, your comments and questions are important to us and do visit our website regularly and follow us on our social media pages for information about our events and knowledge products and of course um, our webinar, last webinar for the month of May on May 27, we'll continue our conversation on the digital economy. This time we'll tackle about gender and other issues in platform work and ICT use in the Philippines. And finally, we'd like to thank the representatives from the different uh, sectors, from government, from academe, uh, civil society, private sector, international organization, and the media for joining us this afternoon. Maraming maraming salamat po. So friends, this ends our um, webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again to our speakers, our uh, our uh, this, um, presenters, and discussants.